Beyond the oceans, along the shorelines of the old world, a day of hope is slowly dawning. All through these battered lands, men's hearts are lighter than they were. Hands are once more busy. In East and West, in Europe and in Asia, the broken threads of life are being joined again. Everywhere, the long tasks of patching the old, building the new, are bravely underway. Responsible for much of this first phase of world reconstruction has been an agency whose job is now officially ended, UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. Set up by 48 governments while the war was still raging, UNRWA symbolized a bold international idea to help those nations to a fresh start which had lost most in fighting the Axis. The plan was simple. Each country which had not been invaded to devote 1% of its income towards a pool of supplies which UNRWA would distribute in the stricken lands. And so in the first days of victory, the United Nations stretched a lifeline of assistance to those who had assisted them. <laughs> Clothing and shoes, serums and bandages, above all food, Food to give new strength to limbs enfeebled by the long, lean years of want. Here for millions was the first tangible evidence that friendship between nations could be more than pious words embodied in a charter. But for UNRWA's administrators, the task was not only one of mere relief. Their greater duty was to rehabilitate, to send the needy nations all the myriad necessities required to restart the daily round in factory and field. 25 million tons they sent, everything from fuel to phosphate, much of it from North America. And it was America, the largest contributor to UNRWA's plan, that became, as well, UNRWA's sternest critic. Trucks, for instance. Was it wise, some observers ask, to send thousands of vehicles, however badly needed, to the countries of Eastern Europe? Was there not a risk that they might be put to military use? Others questioned the sending of supplies to the devastated regions of the Soviet Union. Should the United States participate in arranging aid for former allies who were communists? And did it serve the national interest to send large consignments of materials, many of them in short supply at home, to foreign countries, even when they were required for humanitarian ends. And China. Did it make sense, some ask? to unload precious stores at the gateways of a country split with faction and civil war? Who could be sure that the helping hand could reach out through all the vastness of China's space and time to those who really needed it? But many others, as they watched the lifelines stretching out to where the need was greatest, 
saw UNRWA's efforts in a different light. For were not states and nations made up of human beings, of people, whose despair could turn to joy at the simple fact of being remembered? And in combining with other nations to help the people help themselves, were we not sowing the seeds of future goodwill between man and man all around the world? Here, for example, in far off Honan, is what was once a farm, once the home and livelihood of Wang Ziming. And to this Chinese farmer, those unwrought trucks plowing their way to his village along the rutted tracks brought not only a square meal for himself and fertilizer for his land, but a memory as well. And here on the fishing keys of southern Greece, where Mitsas Yamoulis and his friends sat patching their worn-out nets, it was the same. Tomorrow, with new gear and a good catch, life would look very different, and that, too, will be remembered. Even the tragic lot of the displaced persons was warmed by man's humanity to man. Marie Novakova, Czechoslovak citizen, deported for slave labor in Germany and now lost on the homeward road. To countless families like hers, searching through the living flotsam of Europe for some sign of a familiar face, UNRWA brought a spring of hope. And for seven millions, it helped to crown hope with the sudden wonder of reunion amid scenes which none who saw them can forget. Here, too, on the island of Sardinia, folks still recall when the locust swarms came down on the first precious peacetime crops, and they fought in desperation for the little that they had. And they still remember how the jeeps rolled in to help, how that strange white cloud they left behind turned the tide in a few short hours and saved their winter's bread. But many hold that UNRWA's greatest contribution, at a time when the past lay everywhere in ruin, was to open man's eyes to the wonders which the modern age can offer to help build a more contented world. To millions, it brought a first glimpse of what machines can do to sweep away not only present cold and hunger, but the older, deeper ills of toil and poverty. To millions more, it proved that drought and flood and famine can now be conquered, that man today commands the tools to move mountains and to change the course of mighty rivers, if he so wills. showed what some could hardly believe, that planes can spray the earth with health and life as easily as with death. And in setting these new sites for human effort, UNRWA took the first step towards fulfilling the peaceful goal of the United Nations, a better standard of living for all in larger freedom. Now that this humane experiment is ended, UNRWA's 10,000 field workers are wondering who will complete what they began. For none know better than they who have seen it at first hand that the brighter world which all men seek is still a convalescent child.